church is in good hands. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of James, please. The book of James, chapter 4. We we'll begin in verse 4 and we'll read through verse 7. And then keep your Bibles open to that place. And I want you to take notes this morning. You'll notice there's empty spaces right there between chapters uh, or at the end of the sermon on the bulletin. And you can make notes because you're going to be needing to make some of these scriptures because you're going to need to be looking at them later on. In reverence to God, this word may we stand as we read. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is of being an enemy of enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he gives more grace, wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. Lord, we ask that you bless the preaching and the reading of your word today. Dear God, and throughout prayer and scripture, I have sought to earnestly desire the message that needs to be brought to this church in this hour. I ask that you direct us, Father. Give me worthwhile things to say, dear Lord. And may the words that I say, Father, pierce the souls of every person under the sound of my voice in person or by YouTube. Jesus, have your way. And all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. You'll notice the, the title is When Satan Attacks. When Satan Attacks. I want to share with you some things out of the Word of God. I don't have much knowledge on the devil myself as far as personal confrontations, but I do believe with all of my heart that he is real and that he attacks people today. Amen. We have scripture to base that on. So I want to share with you some things in the word of God and let's see if we can find ourselves in the text of the scripture. First of all, I want you to understand that the devil is real. I know I've said that throughout the years over and over again, but I want you to know that the image that he gets at Halloween, it couldn't be further from the truth. He is not a devil or, a, or somebody with a, or a red face and horns and a pitchfork. He is something more, uh, what's the word, more horrible maybe. But the Bible says that he is real and that he does exist. He is the epitome of evil. Three times the scripture tells us that Satan speaks. He spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden to deceive her and take salvation and the grace of God from mankind. He spoke to God in the book of Job when he decided that he wanted to tempt Job. And understand as we read these scriptures today that God had to give his permission for him to do anything to Job. And then we see, friends, in the Gospel of Matthew that he attempted Jesus Christ as he carried on a dialogue with him. He also has followers. We know them as angels. They are called fallen angels, and we refer to them more as demons. But they are counterparts to God's angels, and they carry on his bidding in the world, and they are tremendous in number. Now, I dare say that any of you and I have ever met Satan face to face. We're small change concerning him. But I do promise you, brothers and sisters, that he does have his demons, and they are at work. They are at work in the lives of the people of God. They are at work in the lives of people of the world, and they all have one goal, and that is to destroy God's greatest creation. He appears in Genesis chapter 3. And he doesn't leave until the third chapter of the end of Revelation, Revelation 20. And throughout the history of mankind, friends, and throughout the pages of the Word of God, we see him popping his head up hundreds and hundreds of times. Jesus characterized Satan like this. He gave him a bio sketch. He gave him a resume. 
and it should cause uh, trembling in the hearts and lives of every child of God. That the devil, that is Satan, has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You and I this day, brothers and sisters, lives in a war zone. Now you've seen the pictures just as I have. Overseas in places like Syria and in Baghdad. Oh, the destruction where beautiful buildings used to stand. And there was actually yards where grass grew. But now, brothers and sisters, we see people living in fear. They are afraid that as they lay down with their children at night that a bomb is going to come and destroy their family or a bomb is going to come and destroy their building and take up everything. And, and you see the pictures and everything. And, uh, what used to be buildings stood tall and beautiful are now just piles of concrete and steel. And there is no yard. And we look at that and we said, oh, how horrible it would be to live in those conditions where nothing, absolutely nothing, is beautified and has all been torn up by war. Well, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that that is what Satan wants to bring to your life. He will, you look at that picture and you look at that good because you are in that war zone. Now, we're safe in America and God forbid that anything like that should ever come to us as far as war itself where the bombs fall in our yard and our homes and takes families from us. But brothers and sisters, understand that you are in a war zone. Satan wants to come and he wants to ruin our lives. He wants to destroy every home that he possibly can. Why? Because God sanctified the home. And anything that God sanctifies, Satan stands up and says, well, I'm going to make sure that I do all that I can to ruin and break up every home and every marriage that I possibly can. He wants to destroy the church. Why? Because Jesus said he loved the church. He said, okay, Jesus, you love the church. I'm going to do everything that I possibly can to ruin the fellowship of the body of Christ. He wants to destroy everything. He wants to take our life, our livelihood, our children, and just bring them to nothing. And I tell you this morning, friends, that you are absolutely helpless unless... You have the Spirit of the living God live within you, and then you are not, that's what you say, un unvulnerable. You are vulnerable to the attacks of Satan. All you have to do, brothers and sisters, is let your guard down. And all of this goes on, and the devil just sits back and laughs and laughs and laughs. Well, I want to show you four people in the Bible where the Bible actually says that Satan got in their lives, and I want to show you what happened to them. The verse comes out of the book of 1 Samuel. It is a story of the first king of Israel, a man by the name of Saul. Now Saul was anointed the king of Israel. He was chosen by Samuel and chosen by God. He was going to be that person to rule Israel and be their first king. And everyone looked up to him and at first, friends, he was honoring God with his life. But as things were going so good, all of a sudden there was a shepherd boy by the name of David who came in. And you know the story of how he killed Goliath, and that began the downfall of the king by the name of Saul. He looked over there and he saw the praise that little David was getting. He heard the songs that were being sang, how Saul had killed his thousands when David had killed his ten thousands. And all of a sudden the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 14, that the Spirit of God left Saul and an evil spirit came upon him. The first thing that this evil spirit brought into the life of Saul was jealousy. Oh, how he was envious of the praise that David was getting. Now, he was king. He was king. He had all the, the fame and the glory. But, oh, brothers and sisters, here come the devil with that evil spirit that said in his life and said he became jealous. The next thing that came into his life was hatred, spite, and obsessiveness because he said, I hate David and I'm going to do all that I can to have him killed. Well, you and I can read the Bible. We can see what happened to Saul because of this, because the evil spirit came into him and ruined his kingship, took his fame and his fortune away, and in the end, brothers and sisters, took his life. The Bible tells us just that. As he was fighting the Philistines, he disguised himself as a soldier not to be killed. And as he was fighting, 
Arrows were flying all around him. His three sons had died, and the Bible says Saul said all his laws, and then he fell on his sword and took his own life. Would that have happened, brothers and sisters, had he not had that evil spirit in him? I don't think so. But it did, and it did. There's a pattern here. The second man that we see possessed by evil spirits is found over in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. We can't read all of that, but friends, he is called the Gadarene maniac because he lived in the region of the Gadarenes, and he was called the maniac or the demoniac. And friends, he didn't have just one devil living in him. He had legions. That is thousands of thousands of spirits living in him. We're not told how these demons took control of him. We know how they took control of Saul. He wanted fame and power, and his power was being threatened, and so then the evil spirit came. But we're not told exactly how the gathering maniac ended up being controlled by this demon. But look what it done to his life. First of all, it took him out of his home. Oh, yes, he started living in the tombs. He couldn't go back to his home. It took him out of society. He couldn't be in society because he had absolutely no control of his life. None whatsoever. He could not even be clothed. He just went around hollering and screaming, no clothes. And the Bible says he caused physical harm to himself. Then he began cutting himself with stones. But then in verse, 13, or verse 15 of this particular chapter, the Bible says that he met Jesus. And Jesus met all the difference in the world. Jesus came, brothers and sisters, and delivered him. And then after he was delivered of the demons, the Bible says the demons actually began to talk. It tells us the ultimate goal of this demon was to kill this man. They didn't get that privilege because of Jesus. But then he says, listen, we don't want to go back to hell. Hell's a horrible place. Hell's a terrible place. Don't send us back there. There's a herd of swine over here. Let us go and live in this herd of swine. And Jesus said, okay, go ahead. Isn't that something? Man is God's first, or Satan's first choice, but the pigs are of, the, of, of uh, Satan's second choice. And now you've heard the story, you've heard the joke of how Satan went into him and then they ran him down the ocean and killed himself and committed suicide. <laughs> but make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters, they would have done the same thing to the man if they had an opportunity. You see, Satan wants you. He wants to kill your good name. He wants to destroy your family. And let me tell you something, friends. Out of 45 years of preaching, I have seen the devil ruin people's lives. I've seen people come into the church and be baptized and be growing in the Lord. And all of a sudden, Satan gets a foothold in their life. And they lose exactly everything, friends, and they end up on the Satan's rubbish pile. It can happen to you. The third man that we see here in the Bible is a man by the name of Judas. We all know about him. His story is found in John chapter 6, verse 70. Jesus was sitting at the table with him, and he said, I've chosen all 12 of you. And then he spoke up and said, one of you is a devil. Now, I take that to mean that he said, one of you has a devil. You see, Judas' sin was greed. He loved money. Jesus knew that, and I believe that's why he made him the treasure. He had been with Jesus for three years. He had seen every miracle that Jesus had performed. He had heard every sermon that Jesus had preached. But there was something, brothers and sisters, that got in him and began to control him other than God's spirit, and that was the spirit of the devil. And Jesus actually called him a devil. And you know the rest of the story we celebrated at Easter? He betrayed the Son of God for 30 pieces of stone or 30 pieces of silver. But brothers and sisters, don't you throw any rocks at Satan because I promise you, friend, we betray God for more than that every day. We get our eyes and mind on something and, and so we see that, that, that fame was, uh, was uh, 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 Saul's downfall. We see that greed was Judas's downfall. That takes us to a man by the name of Peter. His story is found in Luke Gospel 22, 31. We all know about Peter, but here's what the Bible says. Jesus was having a conversation with Peter, and he says, Peter, the devil wants you. Oh, man. And, and you would think that Jesus would have said something or expounded something to him great, and all he says is, Peter, I prayed for you. 
I pray for you. Oh, the power of people's prayers on behalf of those friends in danger of Satan. Amen. But I'm going to tell you the same thing today. The devil wants you. Laurie, the devil wants you alive. Did you know that? Yeah. Robert, did you know the devil wants you? He does. Jeff, the devil wants you. He's seen something in your life he doesn't like. He's seen you coming to the house of God faithfully, working for God, and he's already set a trap for you. He wants to take you and ruin you. Not because he had any grievance with you, but he hates God so much that he wants to destroy God's greatest creation. That's right. He wants to destroy your life. That's right. And so the devil set a trap for Peter. Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to die. Peter said, I'll go with you, Lord. Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times. That ain't going to happen. I'm Peter. I'm rock guy. That ain't going to happen. You know how he did. A little woman stood. Aren't you one of his disciples? He says, no, not me. And so he denied his heart. Well, then he lost his position of being a disciple. He said, it's over. He went back to his old life. How many times have I seen that happen? God come into people's lives and all of a sudden Satan gets in and causes havoc. He runs straight back to the devil. Straight back to the old life. Now, what was his problem? Pride. Saul's problem was fame and power. Judas's problem was greed. Peter's problem was pride. Oh Lord, I'm not going to deny you. I'm going to be here. Well, the Bible says the Lord sought him out. And you know about the dialogue that they had down by the seashore. They discussed love. Who loved who supremely? And Peter succumbed and said, Lord, I want you. I want to live for you. I'm tired and sick of what the devil has done to my life. Peter turned his life around and became the preacher of Pentecost. It's in the Bible. His sermon saved 3,000 souls. And that was just the beginning. Now history tells us, not the Bible, but history tells us that Peter was so committed to the Lord that later on he was going to die. He was going to be martyred. And he said, don't crucify me the same way Jesus died. I'm not worthy to crucify me upside down. And they say that's how he died. Now in conclusion this morning, I want you to listen. I want you to listen good. You've got to look at what this whole scripture is saying. I want you to go back to the text and I want you to read verse 8. It says in verse 7, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now let me tell you something. I don't know anybody in the right mind that would not resist the devil if they knew the devil was coming after them. But you see, he sets traps for us all the time. And these traps, friends, attacks our greatest weaknesses in our moments of weaknesses. He takes us and he destroys everything that we have. And so he says verse 8 is just as important as verse 7 and they go together. Resist the devil, he will run, but then draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Amen. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to run over with me to Matthew chapter 12. I want to read something real quick to you. Matthew chapter 12 is called the parable of the haunted house. The parable of the haunted house. And I want to show you what James was saying and what Jesus is saying here. Verses 43 through 45. Read with me these scriptures. They're very important. Matthew 12. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, that is the devil, he walks through dry places seeking rest. He finds none. He says, I will return into my house from whence I came. From when he has come, he finds it, or when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goes he and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. Now remember, he says seven, that's a complete number. At least a legion can live inside of you. More wicked than himself, and they enter in, they dwell, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Friend, this is the secret of keeping the devil out of your life. Years ago, I've told you several times, I visited the land of Haiti. 
And we walked about seven miles up into a village, and there we was going to put a well pump in. It was a hand pump, where they dug the hole and it was going to put the well. But the testimony that John gave about this village was extraordinary. You see, people are controlled by voodooism in Haiti. Now, voodooism is a religion of fear, and it's often been called the religion of Satan, voodooism. Well, anyway, when he moved into the city and put the well pump in, the witch doctor met him and said, uh, uh, said you don't belong here. He said, I give you two days to, uh, or, or two, two weeks to pack up and get out. And John told the witch doctor, said, you give me two weeks, I give you two days. In two days, the witch doctor left and they built a church where his house stood. That's the power of God. But what, what he did, brothers and sisters, he replaced the wicked with something good. Another village that we visited on a Thursday night when they had their prayer meetings. On Thursday night, we went up to, to the uh, uh, on the side of a mountain. And there, there was a young man that got up and sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. Now, the day before, he had just surrendered his life to Jesus and had disavowed the fear of voodooism. And oh, you've never heard anything so beautiful as in the native tongue of the Haitians as he sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. Friend, I want you to know it's not enough just to say goodbye to the devil and say, all right, I'm through with you, devil. I don't have any more use of you. It's like a person who says, well, I'm going to quit drinking, but I'm going to do it on my own. Well, that's good. You're emptying your life or something. But if you don't fill it with something good and positive, then guess what? The devil is going to come back, and he's going to come back with a vengeance. If you want the devil out of your life, if you want to set a guard against your house and your life to make sure that Satan doesn't get it in, you better start filling it with good things. I'm telling you, friends, church life must become important. Your daily walk with God must become important. Your prayer time, you must become a prayer warrior. And I'm not saying be somebody that just uh, gets down and says a prayer and says amen and goes to bed. I'm talking about you must guard with your heart and your life and your soul your daily prayer time. You see, if you don't do these things, Satan will come in and he will destroy everything that you have. You see, he's in the business of ruining you. And the Bible says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against spirits. That's why you have to dress yourself in the armor of God. You have to be prepared and ready for the devil to come in and ruin you. Here today, you need to make a vow with the God of all heaven and a pact that said, I'm not going to give my life to the devil. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, don't give place to the devil. Go into every room of your house and pray. Take, go down to the grocery store, buy you a bottle of olive oil, and go in and knock on your door and say, I'll not let the devil in my house. I'll not let him come and ruin my children. I'll not let him have my family. I will fight him with all that I have, and the only thing that I have is my walk with God, but it will give me enough power to overcome him in any way. You need to do that. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, Satan's after you. And if you give place to the devil, and if you invite the devil in your home, in your life, he will destroy you. Amen. Oh, yeah. Man, I'm talking to you. Oh, yeah. You got, nobody knows at night when the family's asleep and you got that iPhone and there you're, scro you're scrolling through the pornography. Well, my wife don't care nothing about me anymore. She's not interested. i got to find something to satisfy me. Brothers, you're inviting the devil and you're inviting hell into your life. Right. And you women folk, oh yeah, on Facebook you found this old boyfriend. Well, I'm just talking to him. Oh, you're opening the door, brothers and sisters, for the devil to come in and ruin you. Amen. I'm talking to the families today. When you, you're sitting there, well, old children, we're going to watch this movie. But oh, when the naked scenes come on, you turn your head. When the bad words come on, you cover your ears. Give me a break. That's right. You're letting the devil come in and ruin your home. Yeah. You know, I like country music. And I was you know, I'm always looking for something to watch on television. They had this show one time called Nashville. Oh boy, I'm going to love this because I like country music. I watched one show for one hour. In one hour's time, they had seven adulterous scenes. So, no, 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 no. Cut that off, buddy. And what did they have on cartoons today? Oh, very uh, unharming things, cartoons with male marrying male and female marrying female. Oh, brothers, I'm telling you, you let the devil. 
going to destroy everything that you have. It's time to close the door. The evil spirits of Satan are real. They're all through the Bible. And they will be in your front yard today if you let it. Don't give place to the devil. Don't give place to the devil. Today, commit your house to God. Your children are laying there to sleep, go in there and pray. Pray hard and pray powerful. Say, I'm not going to give my children to you. I'm not going to let you destroy their lives. I'm just not going to do it. Don't get the devil in your house. You give him an inch, he'll take a mile. You just give him a foothold, he'll take everything that you got. Stay with me.